Next up, I am super excited about this one because these are um, friends of mine uh, and ex-coworkers of mine as well. <laughs> so next up, we actually have Race Per Se and Perry Wu from State Farm here to share with us um, the journey that State Farm has had. Hi, <laughs> it's so exciting. Thanks. Thanks for having us back, we're excited. Hi, Perry. Hey, Pinky. I saw Race yesterday, so now I'm excited to see Perry. <laughs> okay. I don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take it away, y'all. All right, let me share my screen. Hopefully y'all can see that. All right. Well, welcome to you know, GitOps and Flux at State Farm. Uh, we, we had the opportunity to speak yesterday at a high level. We're going to take a, a technical deep dive today. Um, my name is Ray Sprose. I'm Senior Engineering Manager at State Farm. Uh, I manage like our change automation team, responsible for kind of like, GitOps and Flux and the big picture and, and how we automate change for State Farm. And I'm honored today to be joined by uh, Perry on my team. So Perry, can you introduce yourself? Yep. So my name is Perry Wu. Um, I'm a software engineer uh, under race and uh, we're responsible for applying, implementing and promoting best practices for GitOps um, for State Farm uh, in order to deploy under pathway to production. Awesome. Let's get into this thing. So quick background on State Farm if you're not familiar with us, but highly regulated environment with insurance. Um, we have tons of compliance obligations we have to meet. We have extremely high standards for security. Uh, for every change that goes out the door, we have auditing requirements. And so we need a record of that change. And so then we need to be able to look back on that in the future. Um, so, so very, very tough environment to be in sometimes, but I like to think of it as, as a fun environment. Uh, our Kubernetes footprint, we're pretty, pretty large. I know this is not the biggest ever. I've seen some pretty crazy clusters out there in other uh, talks. Um, but our on-prem clusters, uh, we have our own data centers. Uh, we have 400 nodes across test and production, uh, over a thousand namespaces, and really double that if you count like our clusters that are replicated, and over 7,000 deployments, just add, just your normal deployments uh, in in those clusters. We're growing in EKS. We actually have a lot of new clusters being built there. Um, they're mostly single tenant clusters dedicated to a certain area. Um, but these are kind of starting to bridge together, and how we do GitOps and all that still works on no matter where you're at, because it's all Kubernetes. Um, but that, that's our, our Kubernetes footprint as it exists today. Uh, so in this big environment, in this highly regulated environment, how do we check all these boxes for risk, compliance, and auditing, and security? Uh, and at the end of the day, we really just want to offer an amazing developer experience. Like, we don't want to bog down teams and you know reduce the speed at which they're delivering just because of all these things we have to hit. And so how can we do that? And GitOps uh, to the rescue. It was and the reason I say that is really it was not until GitOps when we learned of GitOps and we learned of Flux. It was really when we started to rethink how we thought about change and how we could change or you know take the tools we use today and off, integrate them with our existing patterns and systems that we needed uh, to still hit all our requirements but still uh, make the developer's life enjoyable. Um, I'm not going to explain what GitOps is. If you're at this conference, I, I hope that's, that's clear by now. This is day two. <laughs> but uh, number one on our list is to adopt a, a GitOps mindset uh, to what you do. Um, we got some questions on this yesterday about how we, in a regulatory environment, how do we actually like enforce uh, our requirements and how do we lock down things? And I'm hoping this today will answer some of those questions. And so we actually separate our source repos, like where you do your development, like the normal thing that when you check in something into Git, that's your repo where you start. We have a separate repo that is dedicated just for production. And those are highly, highly locked down. And I mean, like, you, the developer cannot see settings. The, you can't change the merge request approval rules. Um, you can't rewrite the Git history. Uh, those things are permanent forever. And that's extremely important. But that is how we're, we're hitting all of our auditing requirements. Uh, we, actually, we automate the creation of the production uh, config repos uh, with Terraform. And we're going to talk about that today. You also want to automate your Flux installation and how that's used, and we're going to dive deep into that. We have uh, Fluxes installing Fluxes, which we always like to talk about. And then enforce your branch approval rules, like whatever those rules may be. We, we have a, a, quite a complex setup. It's not just branch and approval rules, but um, you want to enforce that on a cadence. And so what I mean by that is if someone were to sneak in, we've had it happen, where um, we have a great security team at State Farm that loves to just kind of poke things every now and then and see what they can do. And we've had numerous occasions where they've gotten us and we've actually made our systems better because of, of, of their actions. But um, the enforcement on a cadence will always put things back to how they were. Uh, 
you don't want to just set these things up and forget about them. Uh, you want to be enforcing that as often as you can. And we're at a certain spot today and hope to get somewhere better in the future. So a lot of text, a lot of words. I like pictures. And so this is, I, hate, I had to drop the great GitOps Days uh, background for this, but this is a lot of images I'm going to squeeze into one slide. But just to walk everyone through our flow of how this works with two repos, that's really what I'm trying to drill home here. So you still start today with the traditional CI CD pipeline, just like you would for anything to deliver something out into an environment. So starting in the top left, I'll let you guess what our favorite uh, CI system is. Starting in the top left, you have to build your app. You just got to compile your code. You got to push a Docker image up. Uh, whatever that may be, and this, this is a very abbreviated pipeline, forgive me, but trying to fit things on one screen here. So build your code, you want to deploy your code, this might be a kubectl apply if you're just straight up applying in your Kubernetes environment. We actually highly recommend that you use uh, Flux in your test environments as well. So like, why not? You want to deploy and test just like you're doing in production, so use Flux and test. You probably want to do some security scans. We had a great presentation right before us on uh, Aqua Security. Maybe you're working trivia into your in, into your pipelines here. After that, you get to the very end of the pipeline. And so we've got two stages here. I'm going to talk about the bottom stage first. Uh, upload evidence to test is what this stands for. And so we have external repos that just host your unit tests, your scans, things like that for a long retention period. So we can look back and say this version of the code had this evidence of test to go with it to go out to production. The top box is more important. And so this is not an official tool. This is an internal state farm tool. We, we built a GitOps uh, CLI that all it does, it sounds fancy, but all it does, and I, I don't mean any disrespect to, to the guy that wrote it because he's an, an awesome uh, engineer, but um, at the end of the day, it abstracts all of the complicated kind of git command, git commits, opening branches, uh, opening merge requests, things like that, and just puts it in one tool. And so we're trying to just make things really easy uh, when you're interacting with Git. That's all, it, that's all it does. So at the end of that pipeline, you're all complete. You've gone through the GitOps CLI and you have that separate production config repo um, that is locked down. The GitOps CLI will take care of opening that merge request on that repo for you and it copies all the code that you want over that will go out to production. And so in, in the case of the Kubernetes deployment, these will be your deployment file, your ingress, your load balancer things, like whatever, whatever you it was required for your app to get out to production, copies that over to this config repo. This is where the normal kind of Git behavior can happen. Um, you can talk about it in the comments. Uh, leadership can approve it. We actually link the evidence of test to the merge request. So you can view uh, this version of the code has all of this as evidence that it that can go out to production. And then finally, we, we enforce the merge approval rules where a, a member of the leadership team has to approve the change before it's deployed. And so until then, anybody can merge after that, but that approval has to happen first before any merge button can be hit. And so as soon as it is uh, in the main branch or master branch, uh, that's where Flux is watching. And so we talked about this a little yesterday that you get multi-site, multi-region deployments with Flux, which is awesome. And so with one commit, with one merge and, and uh, approval, you're deploying the every site at, at, at once and whatever the cadence of Flux is, which is probably every minute. Um, so you've got your deployments going out to both clusters and uh, Flux will converge on that state in both clusters. So that very high level, that is how our flow works. That's how that repo is separate. And so you might be asking yourself, well, what, what is a config repo? And so I'm going to hand it over to Perry to talk about what they are and then how we also set them up uh, with automation. Yep. Uh, great. Thanks, Reese. Uh, you're able to hear me just fine. Sound good. All right. So um, we left off on that previous uh, diagram on the config repos where leadership has approvals. So let's talk about that. So what is a config repo? Um, as State Farm set up, um, config repos point to production. So we have to tightly control the config repo access. So uh, people can't willy-nilly um, basically approve their own merge requests um, or pull requests. Um, get them merged in and have uh, immediate deployment to production. There's certain rules to follow when it comes to that. So that's done by the GitOps team and also through Terraform. So I can show you in a diagram uh, later in the next slide, um, but I kind of want to talk through it real quick. We have an onboarding app, and that onboarding app is basically a user interface UI where a team can onboard a new namespace and config repo. So from that, 
they would get into, that would kick off a pipeline to Terraform, and Terraform actually controls the user access and pull request approval rules. Um, this will be the repository where deployments will be applied from, and this includes, uh, as we may all be familiar with, Kubernetes manifests. Um, and if if you're thinking about um, GitOps and Flux, for me, Flux is a tool for deploying to Kubernetes, but GitOps is a mindset. So when we talk about the config repo itself, we talk about more than just Kubernetes manifest. We, if you think about Terraform Cloud with VCS integration or any other app, kind of app you want to support, um, you want to deploy infrastructure, you want to deploy code out into production, uh, config repo takes care of all of that. And that's where your, that's where your source of truth is um, from our perspective. And again, um, as we saw in the previous diagram, um, it's not your source code repo. Your source code repo is what happens where you have kubectl apply, you have your build, you have your test, you have your evidence of test, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of that's kind of our theory behind it and what a config repo means for us at State Farm. So Ray, can you go to the next slide, thanks. Um, so provisioning config repos, like we mentioned, it's uh, we try to have minimal user input to create because it's a lot prone to error. If you remember back to our previous slide where we talk about you know 1,000 plus namespaces, if you imagine maybe uh, one team owns maybe one or two Kubernetes namespaces within a cluster, um, that's about like 500 teams. And uh, coming from the GitOps, if we were to manually do that, it would be really hard to support. So that's why we chose um, Terraform. Uh, to, to basically automate kind of that, that, that kind of that portion. Um, so that's what a UI does. It requires minimal user input to create. Um, it's tightly controlled with uh, LDAP synchronization, synchronization. I'm not gonna let you guess uh, what's our favorite CI tool because I call it out in the slide, it's GitLab. <laughs> um, we have webhooks for internal reporting tools. So whenever a merge request gets opened, merged, uh, closed. Those are all events, and we have our own internal eventing tool. Behind the scenes, it's uh, open search. Um, so we can do analytics and reporting on uh, basically our uh, automated software change pattern. We have badges to signify it's a config repo, um, and then we use Terraform workspaces to tightly uh, control access um, as, with infrastructure as code to provision exactly who gets to approve uh, the, the merge request and who gets to be developers and who can see it. And the enforcement right now actually runs nightly. So that's actually not kind of a 100% good place that we want to be um, because uh, theoretically a um, malicious actor or a developer can just um, potentially add themselves or add someone else and then get their changes in and, and then before the nightly runs kick in. So. GitLab has a really special tool called uh, audit events, and um, that we can kick off basically a webhook based on the, those events. So those events include changing the provider or changing the uh, uh, the approval rules. Those, and it also includes changing uh, who has access and what level of access they have. So what we, what we want to get to in a point is we want to be able to be immediately reactive. So whenever something changes, we want to immediately kick off the pipeline to uh, take away their access and revert to what our infrastructure as code wants us to have. So next slide, please. So this is kind of what it looks like in, um, if you can envision this, um, I'm, I'm not allowed to, we're not allowed to share, you know, internal state form code or anything like that. But if you kind of envision this, um, Terraform, we have a, there's a Terraform GitLab provider out there um, that allows you to create and provision GitLab projects, GitLab groups, and approval rules, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the, the an exam uh, example modules. So like for example, um, in the middle, we have a GitLab project and it's called production repo one. We have a namespace ID, which uh, signifies where it can, uh, uh, which group is, it nest is that config repo nested under. And we have a GitLab group. Um, and at the very top, we have approval rules on who can approve and and what hap and and basically our enforcement for managers. Um, our internal modules are a lot more sophisticated than this, but um, this kind of gives you the idea of how do we provision configuration repos, configuration groups, and enforce um, that visibility, uh, that approval rules, and so on and so forth on behalf of teams automatically. So that's that's kind of like a big big benefit for this using Terraform 
um, as our as our uh, provisioner for repos and groups. So can I go to the next slide, please? So now that we covered what GitLab uh, config repos are, let's let's talk about like from an architecture perspective, how do we manage Flux for a cluster managing over 1,000 namespaces, and how do we enable Flux for individual teams, um, and preferably through an automated fashion, right? Because again, um, this would cause way too much toil for our uh, small GitOps team um, for uh, for the foreseeable future if like if we have to onboard teams manually. So let's go to the next slide, please. So this is kind of the setup. Um, again, we have another UI pattern. So from the left, the user requests a namespace through a UI. It kicks off another GitLab pipeline. And that pipeline, we have, um, a, a, we have a namespace folder. And this commits templated files. So if uh, I don't know if Race has mentioned this, but we're actually in the middle of migrating from Flux v1 to Flux v2. So you'll notice inside of that namespace folder, we have Flux v1 deployment, which is the individual team level fluxes that I'll show in the next diagram. We have the limit ranges. So what are you allowed to provision? How many resources are you allowed to consume within that namespace? The namespace itself um, and some labels apply to the namespace and RBAC. So that controls user access and who can, who's allowed to have admin access to your namespace in that cluster. That gets committed to the config repo, um, goes through a merge or pull request manager approval process again, because it's uh, we treat it as production. Um, and then in our container as a service cluster, and in this case, it's basically Kubernetes, um, we have Flux v2 um, on the cluster level to sync up with the config repo. And then that will uh, that will apply um, basically whenever we do a push or a merge um, uh, the namespace itself and have them all set up as a tenant. All right, so that's a lot. Let's go to the next slide. So I mentioned like we're in the middle of a migration, so um, we kind of want to talk about that as well. Uh, so we started with Flux v1. You know, Flux v2 wasn't a thing when we first started this uh, GitOps journey. It's currently a mix of Flux v2 on the cluster level and Flux v1 on the team level. So they're two distinct things. And the cluster level is what we just saw in the previous slide. Um, and the teams, however, can have their own config repos, like how we provision it through Terraform, through our uh, Terraform modules. Um, so we need to link that up so that we have individual fluxes uh, within the uh, within the namespace that listens on its version one again. So that's why it has to be separate deployments. That listens to the config repo and it applies on the team level, namespace level. It's uh, initially bootstrapped with the Flux CLI. So I'm sure there's a lot of resources, especially uh, the uh, Flux website. Um, that's public documentation on how to bootstrap your own uh, Flux instance. And then we have that Flux, the cluster level Flux v2 that manages each Kubernetes cluster in test and production. And again, the namespace level Flux v1 monitors the team's config repo for deployment and deployment changes. So can we go to the next slide, please? OK, cool. So this is kind of the operations team view. This is another view of what we see as, um, as maintainers for that infrastructure within the Kubernetes cluster. So again, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but we have Flux v2 deployed to both clusters. It applies to both um, both clusters, and it listens to this to this uh, cluster config repo. Notice in our setup we have two folders: one for cluster A, one for cluster B, so they can be drift. Um, inside of those cluster folders, we have a namespace A and a namespace B, and like we mentioned before, that's where those templated um, templated out uh, YAML. The uh, configs come in, the limit ranges, the uh, Flux v1 deployments that listens to the config repo of the team, and then the RBAC that controls who has access to it. Um, there's a lot more that goes to it behind the scenes, but this kind of gives you the general idea of like our, our overall structure. So if you look at the next slide, yeah, so this is where the tenant, what the tenant will see, right? So remember that we deployed Flux v1 into the individual namespace. Um, now teams can control which config repo to listen to as long as it's a production configuration repo. So that's where Flux v1 comes in right now as of this moment. Our goal eventually, obviously, is to migrate to Flux v2, provide a pattern for tenants to migrate. Um, so, But in this instance, uh, basically, we have, a again, 
I don't I kind of want to break it out to make sure that it's kind of clear we have a cluster level flux and we have a tenant level flux and this is kind of what the tenant level flux is um, it listens to a team's configuration repo teams can uh, make merge requests uh, get it approved get it merged and then eventually have that what have that git source of truth within their own team and then flux v1 then will apply to the individual clusters inside the individual namespaces right so next slide please so um, in our in our flux v1 to v2 journey um, we want to talk about how state farm benefits from flux v2 so one of the one of the biggest ones is multi-tenancy right so we talked about how it's kind of we, we kind of see uh, through those diagrams in the, in the very beginning how how cumbersome it is actually um, to maintain one deployment per namespace if we want to segment out teams um, each of the teams will have to create their own Flux instance and monitor that, make sure it's healthy, uh, make sure your SSH keys are up to date, um, able to pull from that repo. So it's actually really a cumbersome pattern, um, but w when we first started with uh, GitOps. We have centralized management versus multiple deployments in each namespace, and that kind of what, what I alluded to in the very beginning. Um, so uh, we also have metrics, alerting, and notification providers. So uh, I'm sure you guys seen previous presentations where we talked about uh, uh, Grafana and uh, Prometheus and also alerting tools that we have now with uh, creating a Flux V2 alert provider and alert. So uh, at State Farm, we use Prometheus to alert. So whenever a metric, uh, metric um, is like uh, too, too much, for example, cluster reconciliation time is over 10 minutes or something like that, we can alert based on that. Uh, whenever there's a change in, in those uh, statistics and uh, performance. Uh, we again, we can use uh, open search uh, uh, coupled with the Flux V2 alert provider and the um, alert itself to, uh, to debug uh, all customization events. So whenever things get synced up, when's the last time we had a repo sync and basically whether or not the, the reconciliation has succeeded or failed. So uh, Prometheus and OpenSearch, that combined with the performance monitoring and dashboards with the Grafana, um, it just provides so much more compared to Flux V1. Um, and I would say, however, the main thing is uh, we want centralized management because you know, uh, if you might have noticed, you know, 1,000 namespaces, I know we might not be the biggest one out there, but 1,000 namespaces across three clusters um, for about 500 teams or more or less is really cumbersome and needs to be automated so that's kind of the lessons learned so uh if you can start with flux v2 um yeah because uh, when we first started the GitOps journey we flux flux v1 was the only thing um it wasn't kind of uh available for us then uh we try to automate team onboarding as much as possible as you mentioned as you've seen through the ui uh, UI and a kicking off a pipeline perspective. That's kind of our workflow for onboarding new teams and new config repos. And also you can prepare and, or excuse me, you can make the pro and try to make the process as seamless for teams. So if you imagine how, how much support, uh, how much support we need for the teams, um, it gets kind of cumbersome. And if we make the process as seamless as possible through the UI and through, uh, through API calls and through templating these files, then we get less uh, support messages and we get less toil on our team. And the last one is you can prepare, but things do go wrong in production. We've seen an instance recently in our migration where uh, we migrated and test just fine, but production, uh, we kind of had an issue with uh, secrets for Flux V1 on, on Teams. So these things, things do go wrong, but we need to prepare for that. And that was kind of a lesson learned for us in our migration journey. All right, so our next steps, we want to really, we really want to migrate tenants over to use Flux V2. Um, they can use this, we have that centralized place for management. Um, we have alerting, we have performance monitoring, and so much more with Flux V2. We really want to encourage education and adoption of patterns for Flux V2. Um, so that's kind of our next step uh, in order to encourage adoption, especially since Flux V1 is getting sunset. And that kind of type, that, that's kind of it. Uh, create documentation, automated migration for Flux V2 for teams to migrate safely and easily and in order to ensure a healthy production environment.
All right, yes, but, yeah, just to summarize, y'all, to wrap this up, we're almost at time. So really recommend to use a GitOps mindset on everything you do, um, and especially if you're in a regulatory environment, separate those config repos from your normal development environment to production and have them isolated with rules. Um, and Perry, like I think uh, you'll agree that, you know, using, using Git makes all this stuff easier. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, Flux, um, I guess the core of it is enables Git as a source of truth. So whatever we have in Git, it gets applied to production. Um, yeah. And we want to be able to easily provide multi-tenancy for teams as a cluster administrator. So we really want to be able to have that separation for teams uh, to own their own namespaces and and be their own admins uh, in their little namespaces and, and like kind of like a logical separation of concerns. Mm -hmm. And that's what Flux V2 provides. So the last one is Flux V2 greatly improves observability for all teams, especially with the alerting, the Grafana dashboards, and Prometheus stack that we can have um, integrated with Flux V2. All right. And that is it, y'all. Thank you. So like, like the, the group's been saying, we'll, we'll be over in Slack answering questions if anybody has any. It's a little strange being on this side of the presentation. I'm still like, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> I was, there is one thing I did want to add, uh, as weird as this is, but I just wanted to add that like one thing that is cool, like a self-promotion, I guess, for my team as well, is that my team actually offers a migration workshop if you are having trouble migrating over mm. to Flux 2. And that is actually something that we took advantage of at State Farm. Yeah. Um, okay. And it really helped out. So <clears throat> if you are trying to move over to Flux 2 um, from Flux 1, you can... Um, take advantage of that option. Yeah, I think well. the design of what we're doing came from that workshop, really. Yeah, the, exactly, yeah. yeah. It was super, yep. super helpful. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you guys so much. Always a pleasure to see you guys, and that was a great talk. Um, thank you. Really, really glad y'all are carrying this on. It's it's cool to see that the changes that are being made. So awesome. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. See you later. Thanks.